Well, good morning, everyone. My name's Ian, and it's my privilege to welcome you to our all-age service, whether you're here with us in the building or, or you're joining us on YouTube. We're going to sing praises to God, led by Gary and the band behind me. And we're going to pray together. We'll have a talk for the children from Peter, our youth pastor. Uh, and then towards the end of the service, our uh, pastor in training, Archie Winnington Ingram, uh, will bring us God's word, continuing to look at the life of Jacob. This morning, um, we're something that we have in common with the, the passage as a church here, and that is lots of babies. You'll see what I mean when we come to the passage. Um, but it's part of the fulfillment of God's promise made to Abraham um, quite a number of years before. And I want to just read to begin with from Genesis chapter 15, just to remind ourselves of what God had said uh, to Abraham. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir. But his son, who is a son who is your own flesh and blood, will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. We come this morning to this great God who is able to do wonderful things for us um, as he did in his promise to Abraham. Let me just pray and then I'll hand over to Gary. Our Father God, we pray that as we come together this morning that we may do so with joyful lips uh, as we bring you our praises, with observant eyes as we read your word, with attentive ears as we listen to it explained to us, with obedient minds as we put into practice uh, what we learn. And above all, we pray that our hearts may be stirred by the presence of your spirits among us, that you will make your presence known to us, that you will be with us, mm -hmm. and that we will truly be blessed through being here. We give you our thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. clouds kings and kingdoms will bow down and every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise who can stop the lord almighty our god is the lion the lion of judah he's roaring with power and fighting our battles every knee will bow before him our god is the lamb the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world his blood breaks the chains every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb every knee will bow before him Is here to set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lion, the Lion that was 
pay for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lion, the Lamb that was slain. Sins of the world, his love breaks the chain. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Yeah. 
Okay, good morning, everybody. For anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Peter, uh, and I'm one of the staff here at Brunswick, and I work with the kids. Uh, and if any of the kids would like to come up, um, I'm going to speak to them in particular. Uh, and just while they're coming, let me remind you that uh, our plan um, is to have a holiday club in October, so the week that the schools are off in October, from the 16th to the 20th of October. That would be in the morning. Uh, probably from about half twelve, or sorry, from about half nine until about half twelve. And if you would be able to be involved um, in that in any way, maybe just for one day, two day, may, two days, maybe the whole week, uh, please let me know. And that could be working directly with kids, or it can be uh, working in the background. Uh, there are lots of possibilities. Okay, now boys and girls, I know lots of you have been on holiday, lots of you have been on away, away. But I wonder, do any of you can any of you remember what our series is that we've been doing over the summer? Okay, there have been two books that we've been in over the summer, and these two main characters. Can anyone remember either of the two main characters? Okay, well, if you know the books, then you know the main characters. Nehemiah and Ezra. That's right. Ezra and Nehemiah. And both of those guys, they were involved in building. Okay, they were both involved in building. Okay, uh, and I don't know if you know uh, this about me, but I quite like to build uh, computers, okay? I quite like to build computers. And I've got this, okay? Does anybody know what this is or what do you think it might do in a computer? What do you think this does in a computer? Do you want to say? Is it a fan to cool down the computer? That's exactly right, okay? It's a fan for cooling the processor. Okay, that sits in the, in the computer. There's a little processor. That's like the brain of the computer. It does lots of things. And it can get really hot. And so this needs to go onto it. And the fan blows air and it keeps it cool. But it came with lots of different attachments, lots of different brackets. Uh, and I'm not sure which of these brackets I should use. Okay, and one of these brackets even has a, like an adjustment thing that you can move around. Um, I wonder if any of you guys have any ideas which bracket, oh, there goes one, which bracket do you think I should be using for my computer? Which bracket do you think would be the right bracket to use? What do you think I should do? What do you think I should do? Use all of them? Just use all of them. Okay, that could be a plan, couldn't it? Just put them all on. Maybe that would work. Okay, that, maybe that worked, or maybe that make, might make my processor overheat. The computer might overheat. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other ideas? Read the instructions. Say that again. Read the instructions. Read the instructions. Do you think that might be a good idea? Yeah. Oh, look, here the, look. Do you mean this thing? Yeah, there's a leaflet that came with it. There's instructions. Oh, look at that. And it's even got pictures and everything to tell me which is the right bracket to use and what is the right way to put it on so my computer won't overheat. Good plan, okay. Now with Ezra and Nehemiah, Ezra, he was involved in getting the temple rebuilt in Jerusalem. And Nehemiah, do you remember what he was involved in building, getting built? What was Nehemiah involved in, do you remember? The wall. Say it again. Wall. The wall, the walls of Jerusalem, okay. So where we've got to in the story is that we're right near the end of the book of Nehemiah. And what's happened is the temple has been built the walls have been rebuilt. So God's people have got all the right stuff, okay? They've got the, the stuff that they need, just like I've got the stuff that I need. But like me, they didn't know what to do. They didn't know what they should be doing, and they didn't know what they shouldn't be doing. So this is what we learned about last week. So what did they do? What could they do? God's people, they had the temple, they had Jerusalem with a wall around it protected, but they didn't know what to do. What could they do? Prayed. Okay, well, they could pray, yeah. That would help them. That would definitely help them, but there was something else that they could do to find out what to do. So what did I need to do? I need to read the instructions. What about God's people? What should God's people do to find out what to do? What could they read? Are there any instructions that they could read. What's that? The Bible. The Bible, exactly. And so what they did was they got Ezra to come, and they didn't all have their own Bibles then, but Ezra came and he read out from the scrolls 
the law of Moses. So basically, he read from the Bible all the instructions to tell the people what they should do and what they shouldn't do. And so they found out. And everyone stood there and they listened. All day they stood and listened. Everyone who could understand, all the men and women and all the children that were old enough to understand, anyone who could understand, they listened. And the priests, they explained it to make sure they knew and understood what was being said. And they found out that there were lots of things that they weren't doing that they should have been doing. And they found out that there were lots of things that they were doing that they shouldn't be doing. And what did they do about that? Does anyone remember? Or what do you think they should do? What should they have done about that? Corrected it. Corrected it, exactly. So what they did is that there's a word that we use for it called repent. What they did was they, they, they felt sorry about what they'd done wrong and they decided we're not going to keep doing the wrong thing. We're not keep, going to keep going our own ways and doing whatever we think is right. But we're going to turn around. We're going to go God's way. We're going to do the things that God wants us to do. And it's the same for us. We need to know what we need to do. And we need to know what we shouldn't do. And we're going to find that out in the Bible. And what we realize when we read the Bible and when somebody tells us uh, what's in the Bible is that everyone starts off going their own way. Everyone starts off going their own way. But we need to come and we need to pray. We need to say sorry to God. And we need to repent and go his way and put our trust in Jesus. And then we will be saved and we can be part of God's people. So we're going to continue uh, after the next song. So just after I pray, there's going to be a video and then there's going to be a song. And during that song, we will head out. Um, so crash. Um, so any of the, the younger babies will uh, uh, head out to, so these rooms are wrong, I think. Uh, Cress should head out to room two. So out this door and head to room two. Okay, I'll be out there if anyone needs directions. Uh, the field, so the preschoolers will head out this way to room three uh, with Luca and Fiona. Kids Church will be with myself and Ruth. We'll be upstairs, uh, so that's anyone sort of primary school aged. Uh, and we will be continuing in the story with Nehemiah and finding out what they did next. Okay, but just before we move on, let me just pray uh, particularly for all the boys and girls. Okay, P R. A Y. Dear God, thank you for today. We thank you for all the boys and girls that are here. Lord, we pray for all those that are on holiday. Um, pray that they would enjoy their holiday, but that they would be, blad uh, they would be glad to come back again. Uh, Lord, I pray for um, all the, the kids church leaders. Lord, we thank you for them. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would uh, bless their time with the children this morning. Pray that the, the kids would listen well and they would learn more of your word. And Lord, I thank you for Jesus, and I thank you that uh, through him, we can be forgiven, Lord. We can repent, and we can come to you, we can be forgiven, and we can be part of your family. So be with us all, and particularly with the boys and girls this morning. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Life is an endless treadmill. Heads down, focused on just getting through. Searching for something or someone that makes it all worthwhile. Something which brings a happiness that lasts, and yet it just feels elusive. These things that we chase promise so much and yet deliver so little. But what if there was a meaning in life which wasn't so fragile? What if there was a satisfaction to be found which wasn't so fleeting? What if there was an identity we could embrace that wasn't so insecure? What if there was a hope we could have that could face anything? That would change everything. You are invited to a series of four evenings exploring humanity's pursuit of meaning, satisfaction, identity and hope, and a chance to discover how Jesus holds out the offer of something better. Uh, 
Uh, morning. Um, my name's Archie. I'm the pastor in training here, like uh, Ian said. And, and before we uh, carry on, I just want to flag this uh, series that we've just watched the trailer for, uh, Something Better. It's going to be over um, four Sundays. If you can grab one of these on your way out, if you don't already have one, the dates uh, for it are on the, on the back. Uh, the, the idea behind this series is really to help people discover something better in life, that is Jesus. Uh, we'll be exploring satisfaction, meaning, identity, and hope. And, and the goal really is to prompt conversations uh, about big questions in life and to see what the Bible might have to offer amidst those sort of conversations. So this time round, we're going to run this series really for ourselves with a, a view to advertising it in our local community and to our friends and our networks and uh, maybe next year. But it is really, the, the series really is designed for people with questions about the Christian faith. So it would be great uh, if you could invite your friends to it. If you have friends that want to know more about what you believe, feel free to do that. If you're here this morning and that's you, you have questions like that, uh, you'd be very welcome to come. Uh, we start this evening um, at 6.30 in the upstairs hall. Um, so it'd be great to see you there. Uh, if you have any questions about it, feel free to grab me after the service this morning. And um, before we move on, and as Pete says during this song, the uh, kids can head out to their groups, but we're going to sing together again. Uh, so over to you. Let's stand together and praise God. I cast my mind to Calvary. Where Jesus fled and died for me, I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree.
this is perhaps I could remind you as well as our evening service when we're looking at something better and we also have our prayer on Zoom tomorrow evening at 8 o'clock and the other thing on during this week is Food Bank Plus on Friday at 10 o'clock. And most people will know that our sister Nan Wilson passed to be with the Lord just over a week ago and we'll continue to remember Ian and the family in prayer in just a minute but I'll give you details of the funeral and the, the burial will be at Cockpen Cemetery a week on Monday, that's the 31st of July at half past 10. And then there'll be a Thanksgiving service here in the church at 12 o'clock on the same day. So that's 31st July, a week on Monday. We're now going to come before the Lord in prayer, so let's join together um, in prayer before him. Our Father, we thank you that we have been able to praise the name of the Lord our God this morning, that we have been able to cast our minds to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me, that we've been able to reflect on the amazing grace that you have shown to us, totally undeserved, only because of your love and your desire that we should be saved from the consequences of our sins. And we thank you that we can come together now as your children, knowing that our sins are forgiven if our trust is in the Lord Jesus, knowing that you are our heavenly Father who loves us, who cares for us, who wants what is best for us. I want this morning, Father, to pray particularly for those who are going through hard times. We pray for Ian uh, and for Elaine and Richard and for Jamie and Ali and their families and we pray at this time of sorrow that you will be close to them. We thank you that they know that Nan is with the Lord Jesus and that for her it is very much better and yet there is sadness. She will be missed. She was a much loved mother, grandmother, great grandmother, a much loved member of this church, very active in service for you. And we thank you for her life and we thank you for the knowledge that her troubles, her sickness is behind her, that she has gone to be with the Lord she loves. And we pray for your blessing on the family and particularly uh, as we look forward to the, the funeral service, pray that it may be glorifying to the Lord Jesus uh, uh, as we think of his servant uh, and of the difference that trusting in him makes. We remember too, Father, others who continue to mourn. Pray for the McLaren family. We pray for the Thompson family uh, and for others who have lost loved ones in recent days, that your comfort and strength may be with them. We pray for those who are unwell too, Father, and we know there are quite a number uh, in our church. We pray for those who, who are in care. We pray for Fiona, uh, for Irene, for Lilius, and for quite a number of others who don't get to be with us regularly. We pray that although they're not able to join us here, Nevertheless, they may be aware of your presence and of the love that you have for them. We look further afield, Father, and pray for our nation. We pray for the governments of our country and pray that they may make decisions which are wise and which are in keeping with your will. We pray for our world too. We remember the situation in Ukraine. We pray for an end to war there, that somehow there may be peace again in that land and we know there are many other places around the world uh, where war is raging and we pray again for those who would bring peace we pray for those who would bring comfort to to those who are suffering particularly for various christian agencies involved um, among those who are uh, in the greatest need in our world we pray that you will help them uh, and that they may show the love of christ uh, to many we pray for many people who have been displaced who are refugees we pray for compassion for them in other countries, that they may be able to rebuild their lives. And again, we pray particularly for Christian organisations seeking to show the love of Christ to them. Our Father, we pray for ourselves. We come this morning with many different needs. Uh, some people may know about, some may be very personal to us. But we thank you that you are the God who can meet all our needs. And we pray that you will help us to trust in you, to trust in Jesus and to know the peace that his presence can give us. 
And we pray too as we come now to your word that, that you would be with us. Pray for Archie uh, as he uh, explains your word to us. Help him to do it with clarity, with conviction and in the power of your spirit. And pray that we may be attentive uh, to what you have to say to us that we may put into practice the things we learn, particularly that we may make sure that our trust is in the Lord Jesus and we are following him. So, Father, we give you our thanks. We commit ourselves to you now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'll hand over to Archie. Um, this morning's passage is uh, an especially tricky passage, and before we read it together, uh, just to get us thinking, um, I want to ask some questions. Uh, firstly, really, what are your roots? What are your roots? I don't know if you've ever seen the kind of ancestry show on the BBC, uh, Who Do You Think You Are?, where celebrities go on it to kind of discover what their roots are. I watched an episode recently with the comedian Jack Whitehall, and he got all excited about one of his ancestors being from Birmingham. He was expecting, I think, to be descended from like a Peaky Blinder or at least some minor aristocrat or something. Instead, he discovered a man who had a taste for sleeping with prostitutes, who got syphilis, who gave it to his wife, and who died in an asylum. What are your roots? Uh, one of my ancestors was the Bishop of London. Uh, I've always been quite proud of that fact. And as far as I can tell, he was a pretty good guy, uh, preaching passionately, working hard for social change in the East End of London. Uh, but I discovered a couple of years ago that he wasn't just straightforwardly a good guy. Uh, he was the Bishop of London during World War I, and he earned the nickname the Belligerent Bishop. Uh, apparently, he would regularly use awful xenophobic language about ordinary German people, and he even promoted the idea that we should be bombing civilians, that that would be the best means of winning the war. What are your roots? If you're a Christian here today, I think it's also worth asking, what are your Christian roots? I mean, you can think about the person who told you about Jesus and who told them and who told them and so, so on. Uh, but go far enough back, and if you're a Christian here today, it's probably partly because of this guy called Charlemagne. Uh, you might have heard of Charlemagne. He was the first man to unite uh, Western Europe and Central Europe, the kind of first guy to do that since the Roman Empire. And it was during his reign that the gospel was first brought to the shores of Britain. If you're here today and you're a Christian, uh, you've got a lot to be grateful to this guy for. Sounds like a pretty good guy. But really... Things were very messy. In the year 782, more than 4,500 Saxons were massacred by Charlemagne for refusing to convert to Christianity. A bit like in our passage today, he had 18 children to seven different women. And those are our roots. If you're a Christian here today, it's also probably partly because of this guy, Oliver Cromwell. Again, you've probably heard of Cromwell. He was an important figure in the kind of continued reformation in Britain challenging the assumptions of divine monarchy and encouraging evangelical independent Protestantism. We've got a lot to be grateful to him for. Sounds pretty good. But again, in doing so, things were messy. In Ireland, October 1649, and apologies for the history lesson here, uh, but in October 1649, troops under Cromwell's command killed more than 3,000 people, including 1,500 civilians. So you can imagine, he was, and in many places still is, wildly unpopular. But these are our Christian roots. The Crusades, the Thirty Years' War, uh, transatlantic slavery, witch hunts, the Inquisition. It was Christians that did all of that. These are our roots. In every century of Christian history, atrocity after atrocity has been committed. And we can discuss whether these people really were Christians. I'm sure some of them weren't but I'm equally sure that some of them really were. And either way, there's no denying it. If you're a Christian here today, these are our roots. As we look down the ages, and as we assess the behavior of individual Christians, maybe especially as we assess the behavior of the Christian church, as we assess our roots, we have to say, don't we, there is something deeply rotten there. In fact, friends of mine have often told me that this is exactly why they're not Christians. 
why they could never be Christians. Just look at all the bad stuff that Christians have done. And they're right. And, you know, I think it's actually much worse than that. Because those are our roots, but it's also true today, isn't it? Friends of mine, they look at history and they say that. But for them, it's also the hypocrisy in the church. The hypocrisy of Christians. You know, they look at us And they just see that we don't look like anything like the Jesus that we say we follow. And again, they're right, aren't they? They're right about me anyway. Nothing like Jesus. My friends know me well enough. If they've ever seen me behind the wheel of a car, as simple as that, they know that I can get very angry and that I'm extremely selfish. And that in so many ways, I'm just like them. Do your friends know that about you? Maybe as you look around this morning, I guess it's possible that you feel like you're the dirtiest and rottenest person in this room. And maybe you feel like if only they knew, they probably wouldn't have even let me in this morning. And let me tell you that the truth is the person sitting next to you probably feels exactly the same way. And if they don't, maybe you're here this morning and that's not you. And instead you think you're, you're doing pretty well, that you actually deserve to be here that you deserve his grace, that you've done everything necessary for God to be kind to you. Either way, whoever you are this morning, wherever you sit, I guess, on that spectrum, you need to know this. As we look at our rotten roots, we have to say that the Christian church could only possibly exist today by God's grace. And as we look at our lives, we have to say the only way that it's going to continue is by God's grace his utterly undeserved kindness to us. God establishes his people by grace in spite of their mess. And God keeps his people by grace in spite of their mess. Grace is the way in and grace is the way on. We've been in this uh, series in Genesis over the last couple of months when God's grace meets our mess. It's the story of Jacob Just before we read our passage this morning, a little bit of context so that you know where we've got to in this story if you haven't been here. Uh, We've seen that the key to understanding this story are God's promises to his people, especially the promises he makes through this family, the promises to Abraham. We've just seen one of those uh, with Ian and then to Abraham's son and then to uh, to Isaac's son, now to, to Jacob. So four things, really, promises of a place to call home, promises of his presence with them, promises of a glorious purpose that they would bless the nations, and then most importantly for us this morning, and as Ian has read, promises that they would be a numerous people. In Genesis chapter 15, we saw God's promise of that in that way to Abraham. In chapter 26, that promise is reaffirmed to Isaac. He says, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And that is a very unlikely promise. And not least because both Abraham and Isaac struggle to have children. But God does just enough to continue their family line. And the promise continues, as we saw just a couple of weeks ago in chapter 28, the promise to Jacob. All four elements were there, place, presence, purpose, and people. Especially for today, your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. And so as we come to our reading this this morning, that promise begins to be fulfilled Uh, But it's not exactly sunshine and roses. And so turn to Genesis chapter 29 with me. Uh, You'll find it on page 32 of the Pew Bibles. Uh, Genesis chapter 29. Uh, We'll we'll mostly be in uh, chapter 30, actually, but we'll start in chapter 29. See with me how God's grace was at work, even in a massive, massive mess. Uh, So chapter 29 from verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord heard that I am not loved, He gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Again, she conceived. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, now at last my husband will become attached to me. 
because I have borne him three sons. So he was named Levi. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, this, uh, this time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. Then she stopped having children. When Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister. So she said to Jacob, give me children or I'll die. Jacob became angry with her and said, am I in the place of God? Who has kept you from having children? Then she said, here is Bilhah, my servant. Sleep with her so that she can bear children for me and I too can build a family through her. So she gave him her servant Bilhah as a wife. Jacob slept with her and she became pregnant and bore him a son. Then Rachel said, God has vindicated me. He has listened to my plea and given me a son. Because of this, she named him Dan. Rachel's uh, servant Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, I have had a great struggle with my sister and I have won. So she named him Naphtali. When Leah saw that she had stopped having children, she took her servant Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Leah's servant Zilpah bore, uh, bore Jacob a son. Then Leah said, what good fortune. So she named him Gad. Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, how happy I am. The woman will call me happy. So she named him Asher. During wheat harvest, Reuben went out into the fields and found some mandrake plants, which he bought, brought to his mother Leah. Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, wasn't it not enough that you took away my husband? Will you take my son's mandrakes too? Very well, Rachel said. He can sleep with you tonight in return for your son's mandrakes. So when Jacob came in from the fields that evening, Leah went out to meet him. You must sleep with me, she said. I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he slept with her that night. God listened to Leah and she became pregnant and bore Jacob a fifth son. Then Leah said, God has rewarded me for giving my servant to my husband. So she named him Issachar. Leah con uh, conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. Then Leah said, God has presented me with a precious gift. This time my husband will treat me with honor because I have borne him six sons. So she named him Zebulun. Sometime later, she gave birth to a daughter and named her Dinah. Then God remembered Rachel. He listened to her and enabled her to conceive. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son and said, God has taken away my disgrace. She named him Joseph and said, may the Lord add to me another son. <clears throat> um, earlier this year, just a, a few months ago, I read uh, that section of Genesis with Ben, Ben Visa, a member here at the church. And we got to this passage literally the week before he married Cater. And so you can imagine how uh, we felt as we read this chapter together. Uh, but before we go any further, let's put ourselves in the shoes of the original readers, the people that this was written for. Let's ask how they were feeling as they read it or heard it read. Because this book, it was written by Moses for the Exodus generation. So it's something like 500 years after the action, after Jacob. Uh, God has rescued this people out of slavery in Egypt, and they're now in the desert. Notice how those promises that we talked about are going. Uh, they don't have a place to call home. They certainly aren't fulfilling their purpose of nation blessing. They are going to have God's presence with them. That will be the tabernacle. But really only one man once a year will get access to that. But crucially, they have become numerous. From a family of around 70 people when they first went into Egypt now over a million when they leave. The people promise, in many ways, the people promise has been fulfilled. But it's actually not going uh, very well. They're not having a great time in the desert. Uh, they might have been slaves in Egypt, but at least they were well fed. At least they had a home. And we're told about their grumbling and their moaning and their infighting. We're told about their idol worship and their rebellion against God. And so as they hear this story about Jacob, as they hear about their roots, the, the beginnings, the genesis of their people, the message was this. 
God established you as his people by grace in spite of their mess, in spite of your mess. And God will keep you by grace in spite of the mess. It is the way in and it is the way on. And so here's the story. As we read it, did you see? It's sort of like a twisted competition. You've got Leah in one corner. You've got Rachel in the other corner. Two sisters, each competing for what the other sister has. Now have a look at verse 30 uh, of uh, chapter 29. We didn't read it just before our passage. Uh, Back in verse 30, Jacob loved Rachel more than he loved Leah. Really, that's instead of, in place of Leah. So Rachel is odds-on favorite in this competition for love. But notice in verse 31, Leah may not be loved, but Rachel is childless. And we'll see in chapter one of verse, uh, of, uh, sorry, verse one of chapter 30, that that is what Rachel desperately wants. Children. Leah wants love. Rachel wants children, each competing, as we'll see, for what the other sister has. Competing, really, for their husband, both of them desiring happy families. And so the competition begins. Uh, The first point goes to Leah. See in verse 32, Leah became pregnant, gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, 1-0. And if you're uh, not sure that this is a competition, and I'm just making that up, notice, uh, notice Reuben's name. You probably have a footnote in your Bible, I think in the Pew Bible, It says there uh, that it means see a son. So Leah has uh, struck the first blow and this name is like a celebration. And it's a celebration designed to kind of show off, to make sure that everyone knows and remembers that she is winning in this competition. Every time they speak about Reuben, it's look, a son. Every time they call his name, look, a son. It's It's a celebration. Leah is winning. And yet in verse 32... Can you hear her heartache? Surely my husband will love me now. She desperately wants him to love her. She desperately wants happy families. And then immediately, verse 33, another son, 2-0. Another in verse 34, 3-0. She's definitely winning, but the heartache continues. Now at last, my husband will become attached to me. Verse 35, the sons keep coming, it's 4-0. And then at the end of chapter 29, then she stopped having children. Half time in the baby making competition. And so Rachel is 4-0 down at at half time. She goes in uh, to have a chat with her husband in verse one of chapter 30. See what she says, give me children or I'll die. Leah's desire for her husband's love is heartbreaking. But so is this, isn't it? Rachel desperately wants children. She too desperately wants happy families. And Jacob's response is really good theology. And not that sensitive, but good theology. Am I in the place of God? He recognizes that conception is ultimately in God's power. Obviously, man and woman need to do their thing and timing needs to be right and whatever else. But ultimately, whether a baby is produced is always a miracle. And so it's not my fault, says Jacob. Uh, Rachel isn't satisfied with that answer. And so she makes a substitution. Uh, In comes Bilhah, her servant. Apparently that was actually quite normal, kind of ancient practice for a servant to step in and give it a go when the couple aren't able to conceive. And the resulting child would actually legally belong to the one that they serve. And that's exactly what happens. In fact, Bilhah has two sons. Uh, Score is 4-2. And notice, again, if you're not convinced that this is a competition, have a look at verse 8 of chapter 30. What does Rachel say? I have had a struggle with my sister, and I have won. And she's very confident here that the comeback is on. Uh, But Leah, Leah, remember, has, has stopped having children. She sees that the substitution is quite a good tactic, so she subs in her servant, Zilpah, uh, and Zilpah conceives twice as well, so it's 6-2. A time for another change of tactic then from Rachel, a kind of nutritional boost, a performance enhancer. In verse 14, uh, Reuben heads out to get some mandrakes. Uh, That is, I think, as if to underline Leah's absolute dominance in this game. She brings out her son to help her have more sons. See, in the ancient world, the mandrake plant was apparently good for uh, for, uh, fertility. 
and probably superstition. Uh, notice the text doesn't really deal with any of that, doesn't confirm uh, whether that's true or not. It doesn't tell us if mandrakes are a good thing or a bad thing. It just says, this is what the woman did. And it's a blunt reminder, I think, in the middle of this competition, as Leah and Rachel uh, fight for their husband's love and his babies, as they fight for happy families, there's an awful irony here. As Leah uses Reuben in this way, that children are caught in the crossfire, that children are literally growing up in the mess of this awful competition. And worse than that, because as Reuben gets some of the performance enhancer, Rachel makes this dreadful bargain with, with Leah. See in verse 15, give me the mandrakes and you can sleep with Jacob tonight. She essentially sells a night of sex with, J with Jacob in exchange for these performance enhancers. Notice how the author repeats that Leah has stopped having children. We get it at the end of chapter 29, as we've seen. But then again in verse 9 here. I think we can assume that she was probably too old to have kids, that nature had run its course. And so Rachel thinks it's safe enough letting her sleep with Jacob. Rachel can then get the mandrakes, get the performance enhancer and have children. And her tactic just massively backfires. I see in verse 16, Leah, with the ultimate chat up line, you must sleep with me because I have hired you. Uh, she's basically turned her husband into a sex slave. It's so grim. And then despite the repetition that she stopped having children, God gets to work and she has another child, 7-2. Somehow in verse 19, she's persuaded her husband back for another, 9-2. And then she has a daughter in verse 21, uh, sorry, 8-2, and then a daughter, 9-2 in verse 21. It looks as though Leah has well and truly won this competition, doesn't it? And yet her heartache right at the end of the chapter is still there in verse 20. This time, my husband will treat me with honor. Nine children later, and still Leah is crying out for the love of her husband. And then finally, almost as a sort of consolation prize, Rachel does conceive herself for the first time in verse 23. Final score, 9-3. It's quite a story, isn't it? And it's a, a strange competition. I think it's really hard to know who we're supposed to be rooting for here. Because you can see how Moses is giving us clues all the way through what these people are like. Every character in this story is sinning and being sinned against as they fight for happy families. And it is anything but just broken, messy relationships everywhere. If you've been wondering through all of this why the Bible doesn't just explicitly condemn these things, like why doesn't it make a comment on the fact that Jacob has more than one wife or the fact that they're literally paying for sex or using wives' servants as sex slaves? I hope you can see that though the Bible doesn't explicitly condemn them, it is pretty clear. It, it has always been God's plan, right? From the first pages of the Bible in Genesis chapter 2, God's plan is that one man would marry one woman and that they would be together for life. That was always God's plan. That remains God's plan today. And I don't think Moses needs to tell us that Jacob and Leah and Rachel aren't doing that. I don't think he needs to explicitly condemn it because the consequences li of living out with God's plan are just really clear in this story, aren't they? It's a mess. And the truth is, sin always leads to a mess. The more you ignore God's plan, the more you walk away from him. You may get away, get away with it for a while, but the more that you do that, the more of a mess you're going to end up in. It's what we see here, isn't it? And I think if we're honest, we all know that's true, even if it's just in small ways. For that wilderness generation, the people that we said that Moses was writing this for, the application is really clear, isn't it? You, you have become a numerous people, but look at your roots. Look at how much of a mess it is. You need to know that God established his people by grace, not just in spite of, but in and through their mess. This is his wonderful, undeserved kindness. If you can see that about your roots, then you will know that God will keep his people by grace in and through their mess. It is the way in and it is the way on. Do you know, uh, God is more active in this section that we've just looked at, more active here than in any other place in the story of Jacob. 
And so just two uh, details quickly before we put the whole thing back together for ourselves. See how God acts. See his grace to the people just in this story. Uh, Firstly, God hears his messy people, and then we'll see that he also helps his messy people. So first, God hears his messy people. And notice that both Leah and Rachel make statements about what they think God is doing in the midst of their competition. There are lots of examples of this. Here are a couple. Uh, In verse 32 of chapter 29, Leah says, the Lord has seen my misery. Again, in verse 33, she says, the Lord heard that I am not loved. Uh, Rachel too does the same sort of thing in chapter 30, verse six. God has vindicated me. He has listened to my plea. Leah again in verse 18, God has rewarded me for giving my servant to my husband. Over and over again, these two sisters make statements about what God is doing. But I don't think we're supposed to take their word for it. In fact, I think we're probably supposed to be skeptical about what their theories about what God is up to are like. In their mess, I'm pretty sure God is not vindicating them. And I certainly don't think God is rewarding them. But they are definitely right that God is working. I see in verse 17, Moses, the the writer, he tells us in verse 17 that God listened to Leah and she became pregnant. And in verse 22, he tells us God remembered Rachel. He listened to her and enabled her to conceive. What can Moses, Moses possibly mean that God listened to these sisters? We don't see them pray. These sisters who had bought and sold their husband for sex, these sisters who had pawned off their own servants as sex slaves for their husband, these sisters who have been battling with one another for their husband's love and babies, these sisters, like I say, as far as we can tell, have not uttered a single prayer to their God. And yet, how is God at work? He hears them. He hears their unspoken pleas to be loved. It's the only thing that Moses tells us that God is explicitly doing for them. These unspoken pleas for family. And they may have sprung from the worst of motives and in the midst of the worst of messes. And yet we're told God hears them. It's the utterly undeserved kindness of grace. The way in and the way on. And that is wonderful news for all of us in the room today. And maybe you think you've got prayer sorted, that you would never pray with such twisted motives. Your life definitely isn't this messy. But if we're honest, certainly if I'm honest, my life can be pretty messy. Very often my motives get twisted when I pray. As our hearts cry out, how wonderful then is this promise from Romans chapter 8. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. When our motives stink, when we pray completely the wrong thing, when we don't know what to pray, and despite all of our mess, this is the utterly undeserved kindness of God to us. It's grace as God hears our deepest hearts cry. But not only does God hear, he also helps his messy people. In verse 31 of uh, chapter 29, right at the start of this uh, competition, how is it that, that Leah is able to conceive? Not only does God see that Leah was not loved, but he also helps her. He enabled her, is the language, to conceive. And more than that, if you notice who it is that Leah gives birth to, in verse 34, she gives birth to a son called Levi, and in verse 35, to Judah. If you know anything about the subsequent history of the tribes of Israel, Levi was the forerunner to the priestly tribe, Judah was the forerunner to the kingly tribe. Do You see what God does, he takes Leah, the unloved and the unlovely, and he gets to work. And through her, he produces the priests and the kings of his people. And wasn't that way of working just exemplified in Jesus? When God became man, who did he go towards? Did he go towards the powerful? 
Did he go towards empire or kings? Did he go towards the religious elites? No, he relentlessly pursued and loved the unloved and the unlovely. The outcasts, the crippled, the sinners, he loved them. He had compassion on them. He heard them and he helped them. Can I just make a a really quick and very specific application at this point, just to those in the room who wish that they could be parents? Maybe you've been trying for years. Maybe you have tried and it didn't work out and those days are well behind you. Maybe you're single. Maybe you're attracted to people of the same sex. Maybe you suffer from a chronic illness. If that's you, if you desperately want a family and it isn't or it hasn't happened for you, let me firstly say how sorry I am. And let me say, please don't feel like you can't mourn that here just because it's something that we can't see. As a church, we want to share in each other's pain like that, that you would find a family here. And let me encourage you that God hears our cries in that. He doesn't say that you will definitely have children. He doesn't promise that. But he does have a plan. And he does have a purpose for us. And he does hear us. And he does help us. God saw the unloved Leah and he saw the childless Rachel and he got to work. And God does continue to work in the world today. Just a little bit broader, if you're here this morning and you feel like you've got very little to offer, if you feel unloved, or if you know that if anyone really knew you, they couldn't possibly love you, that you wouldn't possibly be welcome in a place like this, you need to know this morning, Jesus really does know you. And he knows exactly how you feel. And he also knows all the ways that you have rejected the God who created you. He knows the deepest and darkest cries and the deepest and darkest secrets of your heart. And yet, by grace, he loves you. He doesn't promise that that means you'll have a totally trouble-free life or get all the things that you want. But he does promise that he hears his messy people. And he promises that he will help his messy people. He gives us everything that we need so that we might have the most wonderful gift of all which is to know him. That is the totally undeserved kindness of our God. It's grace. And so just before we finish, let's go back to the original readers. This is what they needed to hear. As they stumbled about in the wilderness, convinced that they had got things really very badly wrong, they were sure that a return to the comfortable life of slavery in Egypt would be the solution. But Moses would say to them, see how God has been gracious to you. Look at your roots. If you've uh, tuned out now, please tune uh, back in now just for the last few minutes. This is really the key. See your roots and know that God established his people by grace in and through their mess. And so know that God will keep his people in and through their mess only by his grace because grace is the way in and grace is the way on and especially tune in now because that remains true for the Christian right if you're here this morning and you wouldn't call yourself a Christian this is right at the heart of it all it's grace God's utterly undeserved kindness to us and it is the way in as humans we need to recognize we are not perfect That is true as we think about our roots, but it's true of us today. We have not lived the way that our creator intended us to live. And the world that we live in is a mess and we contribute to that mess in so many ways. We just can't avoid it. And actually, there's there's also nothing we can do to clean it up. Truth is, there are things that we've done. There are things that I've done that I know that I could never pay for. And so the only way to be accepted by this God is for someone else to pay that price on my behalf. And his grace to you and to me is Jesus. Paying that price on our behalf, that's the cross. Grace is the way in. But grace is also the way on. 
right? Our roots, the, the bishop, Charlemagne, witch hunts and slavery, this has always been true for God's people to keep on being God's people, for the Christian church to have continued at all, despite all of the mess, is only by his wonderful grace to us. Anything good that the Christian church has done over the years, anything good that we have done here at Brunsfield over the years, that is not us. It's only because God has done it by his grace and because we are privileged to be used by him in that. It's true in the big picture like that, but it's also true individually for us as the world remains a mess. And again, as we continue to contribute to to that mess, the the message has always been that, that, yes, grace is the way in, that Jesus died for you and now you're a Christian. But the message is not that you therefore need to start acting like it. Instead, the message is that grace is also the way on. That each and every day, living in and contributing to a messy world, we continue to desperately need and rely on that grace in Jesus. Being a Christian doesn't mean that we've been made perfect, but it means that by his grace, we continue to grow towards him. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul puts it like this. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. You see what he's saying? It's not that he's already perfect. He's on a journey. He's straining toward what is ahead. He's heading in the right direction. This, Paul says, is what it means to be a mature Christian. Not that you are less sinful, though you are really growing in that sort of direction, but actually that you're more aware of your sin. I think it's true in in conversations with some of you who have been Christians for a lot longer than I have. The further on you get, the less sinful you actually are, the more you grow. And yet, the more sinful you actually feel. And as you experience that strange paradox, would you just let it drive you back to the cross? For grace is the way in, but it is also the way on. And just very practically, last thing as we finish, one thing that all of us can do, what this means is that this church that we're part of, this family that we're part of, is the one place where we should be able to be most honest about our sin. Because it it is and should be the one place where grace is readily and always available for it. You know, if a brother or a sister at church tells you about some sin in their life, what's the first thing that you're going to do? Do you immediately tell them how foolish they are, how stupid they've been? Maybe more practically, you're going to try and find ways that you can help them to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Uh, There might, might actually be a place for both of those in time. But the first thing has got to be this. If, if someone comes to you and says, I've been messing up in this way, the first thing has got to be this. Look to Jesus. Because here is grace for you. He loves you and we love you. Because grace is the way in. But it is also the way on. These are your roots. God establishes his people by grace. God keeps his people by grace. It is the way in and it is the way on. And we're going to sing together. Um, and so let me just invite the band up um, as we do that. And as they come up, let me, let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace to us in Jesus. Lord, we're so sorry for the mess of our lives and the ways that we contribute to the mess of the world. Lord, we're so sorry for when we try and do things on our own steam, try and clean up our own act. And Lord, I pray that for each of us this morning, if nothing else, we would know that in our sin, there remains grace for us in Jesus that in every area of our lives, you would help us to repent, to turn to him, to look to the cross 
and to experience his grace, your grace for us in him. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing two songs, uh, two songs I think that uh, just wonderfully help us express our dependence on God and especially our uh, desire to receive his grace and to enjoy his grace. So we're going to sing only by grace and then in Christ alone.
Thank you for being with us this morning. If you would like to speak to our church and me about anything that's been said in the service, if there's anything that is burdening you that you would like to share, if you would like to come to know more about God's grace, please do speak to us. If you're watching online, there's an email address in the YouTube page that you can contact. Let me finish by reading some verses from Isaiah chapter 55. Uh, thinking about the fact that despite our mess, God will work out his purposes of grace. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it blood and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. May God bless you in the coming week. <laughs>